Statistics, hypothesis testing, where we have a one tail lower situation and the standard deviation of the population is known. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get realistic, we need statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts, a must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six pack like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section 1978, hypothesis testing, one tail lower STDP known tab, looking at a scenario similar to recent scenarios, except this time, we're looking at hypothesis testing instead of confidence intervals. We once again have a one tail test situation, but this time on the lower side instead of the upper side. And the standard deviation of the population is known, which means that we're going to be using the normal distributions and will not be using T distributions. But we have similarities to recent examples in that, of course, we're looking to find information about a large population. We can't test every item in that population. There's too many or possibly we can't get access to all of them. Therefore, the strategy, as always, take a sample, test the sample, hoping we can apply the findings found from the sample to the characteristics of the larger population. Two strategies typically used for doing that. One hypothesis testing two confidence intervals confidence intervals lending themselves to situations where maybe we don't know what that middle point is and therefore we're going to have to actually take the sample get the average of the sample that being our middle point and then create a confidence interval around it using some method to do that but this time we're looking at hypothesis testing where the idea is we think we know what that middle point is or have an idea of what it should be. And so therefore, we're going to create our graph around the hypothesis of the middle point. And then we're gonna take our sample and the sample is gonna give us information as to whether we can reject the original hypothesis or not. So in our example, we're gonna imagine we have bottles of honey mustard and the bottle says that there's 17 ounces of honey mustard in the honey mustard bottle. Therefore, we're gonna make that the middle of our graph. We're gonna build our graph around that middle point, that being the hypothesis. Then we'll take our sample and see if the sample is far enough away from that middle point for us to reject it. Now note, oftentimes when we think about this graph, we think about the middle point, if it's a normal distribution, having like 95% of the data, and then two standard deviations away on both the upper and lower end, uh, you might have 5% out in the tails. And if you divide that by two, then you'd have 2.5% out in the tails. In our case though, we're not really worried about being out here. We're gonna imagine maybe this is a government agency or something like that. 
that thinks that the mustard company is is cheating possibly they're trying to deal with inflation in some way shape or form and instead of increasing the prices because possibly the government's saying you can't increase the prices they're trying to do price capping on the mustard in an inflationary time and try trying to have everything at once so they're saying you can't raise the price and uh and you have to have 17 ounces in the ketchup bottle so now they're suspecting that maybe they're putting less than 17 ounces uh, in the ketchup bottle or, or in our case the honey mustard bottle uh, which is what we're testing for so we're worried about just on this side that the actual results that we find when we test the honey mustard bottles are going to be significantly on this side and if it's far enough away then we would reject the original hypothesis now note that if i'm saying that five percent is in this tail which is often a number we will use as the alpha uh that's kind of an arbitrary number which oftentimes we think about as being split between the lower and upper tails but because we only have a lower tail this is a fatter lower tail and we're not worried about the upper side of things in our per particular scenario now also remember that the general idea is that the agency the government agency is is predicting that the amount is too low they're filling up the ketchup bottles too low and putting 17 on the label even though they're filling it up with less than 17 ounces uh, in the bottle that's what gave rise to doing the test however we're going to make the test as though it's innocent until proven guilty like in a court case in the united states where if someone's convicted of criminal charges we're going to say they are they're innocent until proven guilty the fact that they're in court meant that somebody pulled them into court right and had some suspicions but we're going to build the the case around the idea that they are innocent until proven guilty same here the fact that the government official is suspecting that it's lower than 17 ounces in the bottle probably gave rise to the test but the hypothesis is going to be built around the idea that the test is true and then we're going to see if our sample is far enough away which would be past this orange bit for us to reject that hypothesis and accept the alternative that it is not true now this cutoff bit we can measure in two different ways we can measure it in z scores or we can measure it in x's which are going to be in uh, ounces which we will discuss more uh, as we go but that's the general idea all right let's get into the scenario here we're going to say that hypothesis testing we're going to say that per bottle of honey mustard has 17 ounces that's what it says on the bottle that's what we're going to build our graph around we're going to imagine that the standard deviation of the population is known and that's going to be 0.5 the fact that it is known means that that we can use a normal distribution if it's not known and especially if we have a smaller uh, sample size that's when we might have to use the t distributions having a similar concept but having uh, distributions with wider tails which we've discussed before and might discuss more later so the researcher thinks that the mean is less than the label says so we're going to imagine this is a government agency and obviously they know what's going on here they put pressure they're saying you can't raise the price of your mustard because we know how much mustard should cost and we're all knowing we're like the soviet union over here and we know what every condiment as well as everything else in the grocery store should cost and we're not going to let you raise the price so then you would think that they would have to have less mustard in the bottle but they also don't want to let them do that we're going to make you do the less the same amount of mustard so they're suspecting that they're dealing with this pressure by putting less mustard in the bottle so they're going after them now and so then we're going to have you know what's going to happen we're going to have mustard that's going to be watered down that's what's going to happen you can have runny mustard it's going to be like the soviet union shoes right you're going to have the the runny mustard so runny you try to put it on the hot dog and the water just runs off the hot dog and then lands on the shoes and the shoes are so cheap that they fall apart because of the water that came out and hit the shoe because it ran off the hot dog because the mustard's runny that's what's going to happen but here we go we're going to say that the null hypothesis we're, which we're going to show here as h sub N o which is uh h naught is the null hypothesis which again is the assumption that the label is true so even these researchers who are clearly going after the evil capitalist 
company are going to have to assume that it's true if they want to do a proper hypothesis test. They'll probably just lie, but that's what they're supposed to do. Okay, so then the alternative would be H sub A, the alternative. So that would mean if we have enough evidence to reject the original hypothesis, then we would have the alternative, which we're going to represent at H sub A, which we will show shortly uh, in, in, a, in a more abbreviated format. Now, we're going to say that out in universe, this is information that is not known. The researcher doesn't know every item within the population, but we're going to make a population so that we have an idea of what the actual characteristics of the population are. So this is what we know as the viewer of the, of the story that the researcher does not know. We're going to make our data assuming a population of 17 ounces, which means the population is fair, right? 17 in actuality, we're going to imagine the data we create. And then the standard deviation of uh, the population, we're going to say is 0.5. We're going to generate that in Excel. Now, if you want to see this in Excel, we have another course or section on that. But just to give you an idea, uh, we have the data analysis you'd have to turn on if you want to play with that. You can see how to do that. Type it in the chat GTP or something like that. How do you turn on data analysis if you don't have it on? And then we're going to say that we want random numbers, 500, just because 500 is large enough for us to use as our actual population. It's probably, of course, not as large as a large production of honey mustard uh, would be, but it gives us an idea of what is happening so we can see a larger population from which we will take a sample. Then we have a normal distribution, meaning we would expect if we're producing honey mustard with a machine generator that it whatever the middle point is on the average bottle will be will be whatever it is and then there'll be a standard there'll be a normal distribution around it in a similar way as like an error function right it's going to be around a center point so you would expect it to be normally distributed we're going to say that the mean is 17 so it's in the middle that's 17 ounces and the standard deviation is 0.5 so that's going to spit out this data in our example so it spits out this data so that's going to be what we're going to imagine is the actual population so then that information if i was to graph it looks like this which is somewhat bell-shaped but remember that the idea is that we can still use the central limit theorem so although this example is bell-shaped even if the data was skewed to the left skewed to the right or uh, or uniformly distributed, we're going to imagine the bell curve we create is based on the idea that we took every combination of sample of whatever sample size that we will take, in which case the central limit theorem would kick in and hopefully allow us to use the concepts of a bell-shaped curve, even if the data was not bell-shaped. Now, if we take, so, so this, by the way, was a randomly number generated. Now, if we take the actual numbers here, the, the count, is just going to be a count formula. So how much did we count? We had 500, 500 of them. The population mean, which is the average of the data that we got here, which should be close to what we used to generate the data, but not exact, is 17. So the data is a little bit different, it's about almost 17 exactly. And then the standard deviation is going to be the STDEV of the population of these numbers is going to be close to what we used to generate it 0.5 we came up to 0.49 so that this is the actual data which is not known in universe except for we're going to imagine that we know the spread the standard deviation is known so that's and that'll help us to make sure that we can use a normal distribution more easily rather than having to use the fatter tailed t distributions all right so then we want to then create our sample. So this is what we know in universe. How would you actually do this in universe? You would, the, 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 the researcher would go buy a bunch of bottles of mustard from different stores or somehow try to randomly get a bunch of bottles of mustard and then determine how much and then weigh, you know, how much mustard is in each of the bottles of mustard. Now, how could we do that in Excel? Just logistically, well, one, we could take all of the numbers, the first however many numbers, which we're going to say 100 numbers as our sample. You could take the top 100, basically, because these numbers were randomly generated. But if you want to shuffle these numbers, we could do a random column next to it and then shuffle the two columns based on the random number generation. Or we can try to tell Excel, 
pick me some random numbers from these numbers using an index function, which is what we did in Excel. Again, I'm just giving a brief description. If you wanna see how to do that in Excel, we have another course or section, which is a lot longer of a presentation as we go into the formatting of Excel and everything. But here it is, it's gonna be the index function of that set of numbers. And then we take a random between row one and row 500. So this is the actual sample of 100 bottles of mustard that the researcher got to test whether or not those crooked, evil, capitalistic companies that provide all of our food that we depend on all the time are really evil. So now we're gonna say, how do we write this? Well, this is gonna be our hypothesis once again. This is the shortened version of writing it, which looks pretty simple to write, but actually is a little difficult like in a computer to do it. So if you wanna see that in Excel, you can check that out in our other course or section, but H hypothesis sub naught or sub zero colon mu, meaning the mean is greater than or equal to 17. So remember the perspective of the researcher. They're trying to get these capitalist money making producers that provide all the stuff that everybody eats. And, they're, and so what they want to do is say, uh, is, is, and, and they're going to say that they're under producing their honey mustard bottles, so we need to crush them. But so that means that if the, if the number is above 17, which is on the label, then we can't crush them because, because then they actually put the right amount in the bottle. But if, if it's significantly less than 17, then the alternative hypothesis kicks in H sub A, where the average is less than 17. And then the government agency, the nameless, faceless, unvoted for government agency goes in there and puts their boot on the mustard bottle until it's drained of all its life blood, the mustardy lifeblood. So then we're going to say the alpha is going to be the 5%. That's going to be the confidence level, meaning the average or the amount under the curve of this top, this bit on the left is 5%. So remember, 5% is a little tricky because usually we see the 5% as though it's a two tail test, which means that each tail would have 5% divided by 2, 2.5. But this time it's a little larger because all of the 5% is in here. So also note that if we measure this in X's or in Z's, you would expect normally it would be two about one, you know, 1 1.96, two standard deviations to have 95% in the middle, 5% on the tails, but it's gonna be less than that on this side, standard deviations of 1.6 or so, if you only want 5% uh, on one tail instead of two tails. So this tail is a fatter tail than we would have if it's a two tail test using that same kind of 5% that would be in the tails. That's somewhat of an arbitrary number. If we wanted to have a higher level of confidence, we can make this number smaller, making those tails lower, right? So that's, but 5% is often a, a standard uh, format for looking at it. And then the standard deviation of the population, this is not of the sample, standard deviation of the population. I just pulled this number over because it's known to us is this 0.49 standard deviation of the population, not of this uh, sample. We say the standard deviation of the population is known in this example. So we could then take the standard deviation of the sample, which would be this formula, and the standard deviation of the sample, STD of the, of the sample of these numbers instead of, of the red numbers. And that might be necessary to use in order to calculate the standard deviation that will be used to calculate the curve, which is the standard error, if we didn't know the standard deviation of the population, but we do, therefore we're probably not gonna be using this to calculate the standard deviation of, or the standard error. The sample size calculated as uh, the counting, just a count function of all of these numbers comes out to 100, meaning they took 100 bottles of, of what did I call it, mustard, some kind of mustard to check it out. So the X bar or middle point, the mean, remember that we have the mean of the actual population over here, which was actually 17, which is unknown in universe. We have the mean of the actual sample of the sample, which is what we know. That's what we took the mean here, which should tend towards the mean of the population. And we could imagine the mean 
of all combination of samples of sample size 100, which is the idea of what we're making our bell curve from, all three of those should tend towards the same number. And then we have, and that's just the average. And then we have the SE standard error, which is basically the standard deviation that we're using to make our actual graph, the actual graph not being based on the standard deviation of, of like the data or the standard deviation of the sample, but on the idea of the standard deviation of all possible combinations of sample of uh, 100. And that's why we get this, this is the standard deviation that we're gonna be using then uh, in our calculation. And that's useful because it's more likely that the data will be bell-shaped if we think about constructing the data on the standard deviation of all possible combinations of samples due to the central limit theorem. So that's gonna be calculated as the standard deviation of the population if it's known, which it is, which is 0.49, divided by the square root of n, which is the sample size, the 100. So that's this formula. And then we're gonna say, okay, the, 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 the z then, what is the t-test? Now remember that our actual graph over here is based on the hypothesis that the 17 on the bottle is correct. And we're trying to see if our test is far enough away on this side typically, because we're worried that they'll be underfilled to reject it. So if this is the amount that we actually got, I can, I can measure that and say, how close is that to my graph's center point, which was based on the hypothesis of 17. And I can calculate it in Z's then. So Z's meaning in standard deviations. So I can say 16.96 minus the 17, uh, 17 is gonna give us the difference divided by the, the standard deviations or standard error 0.049 and that gives us about 0 0.816 and so on. So notice that this is pretty close to the 17 and if I convert it to standard deviations, it's not even one standard deviation on the low side, which you would think is starting to give us evidence that it's not far enough away for us to reject the the original hypotheses because it looks pretty close to the middle point right so so we're going to say so maybe the maybe the crooked capitalistic money grabbing price gouging mustard company didn't do it according but then so that means that the government's going to have to lie if that's the case because they have to be evil somehow what are they going to do they're going to put a lower price cap on it or so. I don't know. They'll figure something out. So the p-value, then if we calculate the p-value, then what, what is that going to be? We can say this is going to be the norm.dist of the z, which is now going to be taking that bit, uh, that, that z, and then comma, and give us the cumulative. So it comes out to uh, point two. So, so the p-value, so the idea here is we're going to say, here's the middle point based on the hypothesis. The amount that we actually got was dang close. It was like right next to it, it's still on the left, but it was pretty close. So it doesn't, it's clearly doesn't look like it's over here in the, in the, the 5%. It's not past basically the hurdle. Now, what's the area under this curve? The orange bit, it's 5%. So that means like if my if the actual number I got was over here, then the area of this curve on the left would be greater than 5%, uh, which it is. It's point, you know, it was it was 0.8 or like 88% or something. So I would need the p-value if the if the hurdle was over here somewhere past this point, the area under the curve would be less than 5%. So and so that means that when I look at it this way, I'd have to say this number would have to be lower than A, alpha, the area under the curve of the orange bit of the graph in order for me to reject the null hypothesis that 17 is the middle point. And of course, we're nowhere near that and therefore we can't reject it based on this information. And then we've got the, the, critical, the critical value which now we're gonna say, okay, 
what if I take the norm.s.inverse of the probability uh, of which is the 5% and now I'm trying to find the critical value, the point measured in Z's, which are standard deviations or standard errors rather than in X's that we would have to clear. So in other words, that 1.64 represents this kind of hurdle rate. And if I'm on the left of the hurdle rate, that's when I have enough evidence to reject the whole, pi whole pipe, the null hypothesis. That would be like in a court case, the evidence is high enough for us to say, uh, we're going to say they're guilty of, of whatever, right? And then if it's on this, so that, so notice that if we had a two tailed test, then five per, and we said 5% are on the ends of the two tails, 95% in the middle, that's around two standard deviations on both sides. But because we only have a one tail test and we kept the 5%, this is higher, meaning we're not quite two standard deviations out in Z's. We're only like that 1.6 or whatever we said it was to clear it. So if, so that's gonna be, so, and we can also convert that to X's. So if I converted this 1.66 to an X, uh, then it would be like 16.92 uh, ounces, right? So if I got something less than 16.92 ounces, maybe I would have enough evidence to say that the null hypothesis this is 17 ounces is not correct and then you put the, the boot of the government on the back of the mustard bottle. So now we're gonna say, let's make our graph. We're gonna say that the Z's are gonna be, let's say negative four to positive four. How do I come up with that? Well, I'm gonna try to measure the distance in Z's to be big enough for my graph. And like we say, normally, if it's a, norm, a bell-shaped curve, within two standard deviations, 95% of the data, within three standard deviations, most of the data will be there. Within four standard deviations, almost 100% of the data will be under the curve, even though in theory, it goes out forever. So if I start at four standard deviations out, four Zs out, and then just go one step, it's gonna be a pretty detailed graph that should encompass enough data to graph everything I need the full curve. Then I can convert those Z's to X's. How do I do that? Well, the Z's represent standard deviations where we're using this standard deviation, the standard error. That's what the graph's based on. 0.049 times four. There's four standard deviations minus the middle point. The graph is based on the middle point, not of the average we got on the sample, but the amount of the of the hypothesis, 17, the amount it says on the bottle. So that comes out to uh, 17, uh, uh, that comes out to this, to what, if that comes out to that, 1608, uh, so 1680. <laughs> it should be positive because of the way the signs went, so I won't. But then I can do that all the way down and convert all of them. And then we get all of our X's and then I can take the P, the, the P of X, which is basically gonna give us our percentages at each of those X points. And that's gonna be norm.dist of X, in this case, 16.8 for the first one. Standard deviation is not the standard deviation of the population or the sample, but rather the standard error. And that's gonna be, remember the graph is built on the idea that we're graphing the average of all possible combinations you know, of sample of 100 out of the sample size in our case of 500 and so that's going to be these and then i'm going to calculate this bit down here where the z has got to be less than that cutoff point which was the 6.45 which was our uh critical value so it has to be less than negative six point i'm sorry 6.4 6.645 and so how do we do that i could do a logic test and say, Excel, give me every time if this number is less than negative 1.645, then give me this percent number. If not, give me a blank cell, which I'm indicating with quotes around a space, which would give me just a space. And then you can see it's graphing all the same numbers here. But if I kept going down, once it gets past this point, it would have a blank space. So that's gonna allow me to graph this bit, the tail on the left-hand side. So that's how we basically construct our graph. And then once I have that built, 
I can add my x axes in terms of x's, which is are in terms in this case of ounces, and in terms of standard deviations, in our case, in terms of z's. And so then, of course, the middle point of our graph built around the hypothesis, innocent till proven guilty, 17, which was on the bottle, 17 ounces, zero in terms of standard deviations. And then we have our critical point that we would have to clear only on the low side because the the reviewer is trying to get the trying to get these evil price gouging capitalists that make all of our stuff that we eat uh, to to say that it's on this side. So they're going to have to. Uh, uh, so 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 this is going to be the the critical value which we could measure in Z's here or we can measure in we can convert that to X's. So if they come up with the tests that are past this point, that's when we might be able to have enough evidence to reject the original hypothesis. But in our case, of course, the ketchup bottles are pretty close. So I'm suspecting the next bit, if the government put a, a price gouge on it and they, they won't let you, a price cap and they won't let you raise the price, we know what happens with like one semester of economics, right? That it's gonna, it's gonna cause a problem right? You can't raise the price. So they're going to, so, and there's inflation happening. So what are they going to do? They're, 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 they, the only other thing they could do is put less mustard in, in, in there. If they won't let them raise the price, the quality of the product's going to get worse. And if they won't let them reduce the amount of mustard that goes in the bottle or raise the price, you're going to get crappy mustard, which is they're going to water it down. You're going to get, a, you're going to get watery mustard. And this, and I'm not, you can't blame it on the mustard company. What are they going to do? The government caused the inflation. The government capped the price. So they couldn't raise the price, even though there's inflation and they won't let them lower the amount of mustard in the bottle because that would make them look bad too. So the mustard gets watered down and crappy. You get crappy mustard. This is what happens. Okay. Oh, anyways. That's the idea.